Um, the kids enjoyed the Easter egg hunt and all that stuff, and uh, they got to scope out the the eggs, if you will, where they were hiding them uh, before everybody else because uh, we showed up a little late while everybody was hiding the eggs, so they were like pointing out the window, you know, looking at all the eggs. <laughs> and then I think by the end, one of my boys had, I don't know, almost two bags full of eggs, you know, bring it back, which was fun, but then last night when we got to the hotel, you know, they've been eating candy. <laughs> and then they, uh, all of a sudden, I don't know, I guess about 9.20 or uh, 9.30, all of a sudden, my oldest son comes running up to me. He's like, guess what? And I'm like, what? He's like, I got a sugar rush. And he starts running all over the place. And I'm like, oh, no. What are we going to do now? But, uh, no, we had a really good time yesterday and, and speaking to some of y'all. And, and um, it's good to see everybody else here today. Um, but we're going to start off uh, this morning in 1 Corinthians, where we're going to be at uh, today. And 1 Corinthians and verse 26 is going to be kind of where we start off. Uh, let's go ahead and pray. Um, Dear Lord, as we come to you in prayer, Father, we just thank you for our Sunday. Lord, as I said before, we thank you for the weather. Thank you, Lord, that, that for everybody here that's out today. Lord, I pray that you'll uh, just, just be here with us today. Lord, speak through your word. Lord, speak through me. Lord, that, that, that I even be forgotten, Lord, that, you, that your message to, to each one of us be remembered. Lord, I pray you'll open our hearts, Lord, and just guard our hearts, Lord, from distractions. And uh, we love you, Father. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So 1 Corinthians 26, let's, let's go ahead and we're going to read the passage basically through the end of the chapter. It says, uh, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen, and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. That, as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Right? And, and kind of the point, if you looked in the bulletin, you're gonna, you'll see the title, uh, kind of a makeshift title. I'm not, I have never really been somebody that puts titles to his messages. I mean, it's, I think it's a good practice. I just kind of forget sometimes, maybe. Uh, but, you know, I put in there, God doesn't choose the strong or the wise. And it's not, just like Paul is saying here, it's not that he always does not choose the wise, the, uh, the strong or the wise, but he tends not to, right? If you look in a crowd of people, that, um, if you take um, a thousand missionaries from around the world, just randomly, and you bring them all together, you're going to look, and guess what? They're probably, some of them are probably funny looking, honestly. Some of them are probably short, some of them are probably bald, some of them probably can't see very well. You know, they might have lots of problems. You know, it'll be very rare that you look in amongst that group and you're going to see a, a doctor, if you will, right, or, or a lawyer. And you will. I'm not saying you can't find them in that group, but it, it'll, it's, more, it's more rare, if you will, right? And so uh, that's the, kind of what, what the Bible's saying here and what Paul is saying. And, you know, I kind of want to tie this into, into my, my testimony of, you know, some of y'all that didn't hear me speaking yesterday and talking kind of about our life, you know, kind of get to know who I am a little bit. Um, when I was young, I, was, I guess about eight years old, my dad was called to preach. And one of the things I remember from that time is, you know what, dad and mom were happy. My dad's a very stubborn guy. Uh, he might not seem like it on the surface if you all ever get to meet him, but he's, uh, he can be very stubborn. But once he's got his way, once he's kind of set in his way, man, he'll stick to it. You know, you try to get him out of that path, i tell you what, you're in for a battle. But, uh, you know, he's a very stubborn guy, so when God was calling him to preach, one of the things I remember, you know, is that just times weren't good. Dad and mom fighting all the time, and they always reflect back on that, is the time that dad was struggling with the call to preach. Right? And when he finally surrendered to preach, and I remember he, he surrendered to preach, and uh, we started traveling around the United States, and that was about the time when uh, you couldn't just go on the internet and email churches. You know, you could send out letters, but that didn't really help anything. You couldn't tell the church, say, hey, you know, look at my Facebook page, and you can see a picture of our family, and that kind of stuff. You know, to get to know other churches and raise support, if you will, to go to the mission field, you basically had to travel. So we went to all these churches about a year and a half. We traveled to all kinds of different churches. I don't know where that came from. Stepping on it. But we traveled all kinds of different churches around the U.S., probably from o Oklahoma on eastward. We, we, went, we went all over the place. Every Sunday, we was in a different uh, uh, church. Every Wednesday, we was in a different place, going place to place. And we had this little uh, camper that we towed behind this uh, Astro, Chevrolet Astro van. You know, and I remember that time was just a good time. You know, Dad's farm the Lord was happy. And that's kind of how I grew up. A, a little while later, um, uh, by about 1990, I was about 10 years old. Uh, we headed off to the mission field in Peru, and we stayed there until I was about 15, about five years. And uh, when, once I was 15, we came back. Uh, all us kids went to high school, you know, and then right after high school, it seemed like dad and mom, they, they, they went right back down in about 2002, uh, back down to the mission field. Uh, but not, I graduated high school in 1999 and I didn't want to go to college. I was so sick of school. I had gotten really good grades up to about, uh, about my junior year. After that, I was tired of it, especially English class. 
I didn't understand English class because why do I need to know what a noun and pronoun are if I'm going to be going out to the world working? I didn't understand that. All right? So uh, I didn't want to go to college, so I joined the Army. I went and talked to the recruiter. I said, hey, you know, what, what kind of jobs you got? He says, oh, we got, we got this, what they call 11 x-ray, they called it. And I was like, oh, what's that? He said, well, do you like shooting guns? Well, yeah, I like shooting guns. All right, so we'll put you in that. Little did I know that that was uh, considered at the time one of the hardest jobs, and still is, in the military because all you do is you don't go to learn how to uh, uh, turn wrenches on a car or learn how to do finances or any of that other stuff. You learn how to shoot guns, which is fine. That part's fun, but they didn't tell me you'd be sleeping outside a lot. You know, there'll be times when we'd be outside for five weeks at a time, sleeping out in the rain and out under the stars, no tents, you know, and just had a little makeshift sleeping bag that we could stick in our, in our bags, you know, five weeks at a time. Sometimes we go down to California, you know, out there in Death Valley, right above Death Valley, and stay out there for five weeks, you know, out in the desert. I don't know what I was thinking, but it was a good time, you know. So I did that for about 11 years. Um, I also, uh, for three years, I was a drill sergeant in the Army, and, and uh, I mean, believe it, yeah, it was, a, it was a crazy life. It's a good life, right, but it, it was crazy. God took, us through, took me through a lot of paths, and then um, 2003 to 2004, I went to Iraq, and, and sadly, this time, I wasn't really living for the Lord, uh, just kind of doing my own thing, did whatever I wanted to do, and then all of a sudden, as I was saying last night, you know, the Lord starts putting you in these situations where you start bargaining with God, right? In psychology, they'll say you're bargaining with a higher power for your life, so I started telling the Lord, if you get me through this, I'm going to do this when I get home, you know, and if you, if you help me through this, and uh, believe it or not, when we were there in Iraq, it was, like I said, 2003 was one of the, some of the first units to go over there. We didn't have very much. You know, there was one time when they, uh, the engineers came with these gigantic bulldozers and they started, they went to the edge of a city and they, bulled out, they bulldozed out uh, a section for us in the landfill so that we could sleep in the middle of it, basically. We slept in there for, for a couple months, you know, just out there on the ground. And I remember that time, all I had was basically my sleeping bag, our vehicle that we, uh, that we did missions in, you know, and some of my guys. And, 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 but that's all we had, and that and the Lord. No TV, there was nothing else. We didn't have music, we didn't have anything. You know, and I remember that was, I, I felt in my life, was some of the closest times I have with God, you know, being out there in the middle of the place, and we had this real, uh, one real strong Christian guy I used to talk to all the time, and, you know, he's a big influence on me, and, and just, you know, helped me get my life back on track, and one of those things that I, I told the Lord while we was out there in Iraq was, hey, Lord, uh, I'll get back into music, all right, and I didn't tell the guys this, you know, I don't want other infantry soldiers knowing that I used to do music, it'd be kind of embarrassing, they make fun of me, uh, but I grew up, as you know, like I said, in a missionary family, and my mom's Filipino, and she always made us sing. Filipinos love to sing. If you don't know any Filipinos, they love to sing for some reason, and, uh, but, which is a good thing. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but they love singing, so she made all us kids sing. My sisters loved it. I didn't like it so much. I didn't like getting up in front of people and singing. I thought it was silly. You know, I didn't like playing the piano, but she made me do it. You know, and to the, I, I'm thankful to this day that I did it, but I didn't like it at the time. But that was one of the things I, I told the Lord. It's like, Lord, I need, to, I need to get back into music. That's one thing I'll do if you get me through this. Uh, so uh, when we were done with our tour there in Iraq, we were sitting in the Air Force base, and, and I was like, we had a little internet station there. So I was like, oh, I'll look up for a, a, a music school that's far enough away from the base so, you know, so I won't accidentally run into any of my buddies and they'll make fun of me. Right? And I found a music school that's about 60 miles away. And uh, so I started going there, and I found one of the last slots in the day, again, so I wouldn't run into many people. And uh, I went there, and, and I, I'll never forget it. I went to the front of this little building, and I tried to get in the door, and I was like, man, it's locked up. Well, I, can't, I guess I can't you know, have my lesson or anything. So I started to turn around and leave. And all of a sudden, I hear from the side of the building, it's kind of weird because it was dark, and, and then all of a sudden, I hear the voice saying, are you Rodney? And I'm like looking around like, who in the world said that? You know, here we are. I felt like, you know, a building, all the lights were off, and I look around the side of the building, and, and there's my teacher. She had called me to the back, because I guess it, after certain hours, they closed the front of the store, and they just had people go around the back uh, there and do the lessons in the classrooms in the back. And then that's how I met my wife. She was the person that said, are you Rodney? All right, and she, she, was my, she was my music teacher there for a, a couple weeks. And that's how, so that's how I met her uh, and ended up marrying my teacher. I think it's kind of a fun story, um, but um, kind of like a little fairy tale. And I, I enjoy my wife. I love my wife. I tell you, she's uh, been a huge influence on me. As I was saying last night also, I felt like I'd catch up to her spiritually because every time she would talk, I felt like she was speaking scripture. When she was praying, I thought she was reading the Bible or something. You know, I was like, man, I got a long way to go to catch up with her if I feel like, you know, I can be worthy of her. But, you know, that's how I met my wife. She's been a great encouragement to me. And then... Uh, uh, shortly after that, you know, I went off to be a drill sergeant. I was still at the military at the time. And uh, drill sergeant for three years. Did that for three years. Uh, one, two years over basic training. I did one year training other drill sergeants. And I was about 60 days from getting out of the Army. I was, I was done with it. You know, I was, I was getting to the point where I needed to either decide to stay in or, or get out. And I was like, I'm going to get out. You know, I want to go do something else. Um, I had about a month left or, or so on, on my contract. And then I was in a real bad motorcycle accident. And this is kind of where I want to start tying in. Uh, you know, everything that, that, that's happened with the scripture is, 
You know, at that time in my life, I, I felt like, and I don't say this to pat myself on the back. I, it, it, there's fond memories in it, but it, it, there was a big lesson in it for me. You know, I felt like I was a pretty strong guy at the time. You know, with the kind of jobs that I was in, you know, I was paid to be in shape, paid, paid to be able to shoot. That, that was my job description, if you will. Paid to train other soldiers to be able to do the same thing. And, and I, I considered myself a pretty strong guy. I was, I was arrogant and cocky, as you, as you can probably imagine some soldiers are. Uh, one thing I used to do as a basic training drill sergeant, I used to say, hey, you know, when it came time to do the hand-to-hand -hand combat training, I would get all the soldiers together because I was in charge of that, and I would say, whoever, you, the toughest guy here, thinks of the toughest guy, come out here in the middle, and, and I'll show you why our hand-to-hand -hand program is good. And, you know, we'd always get these big guys. I remember the first time I said that, I would get scared a little bit. I was like, well, I already said it, I can't back down now. So we get these big old dudes coming out here, and they'd say, all right, come on, drill sergeant, we'll go. And we'd go, and, and you know, there we, you know, a couple, couple of seconds later, and, I'm not, and not, I don't like patting myself on the back about this, but it's to make a point. So, you know, there were every single time, 10 cycles that, that I was a drill sergeant over basic training, beat every single one of them, right? Less than a minute, easy. And then it wasn't because, it was just because I was some super skilled, it was just because it was a diff, you know, just what we were trained to do. And so that was the one thing that turned the soldiers on, saying, hey, we need to learn this too, right? And there it was, so we'd teach them. And, and you know, so I was, I was good at that, and I would do uh, the hand-to-hand -hand tournaments there in the Army, and... I remember one tournament that, that I was there, I, uh, the, uh, one of the guys that was part of our team, if you will, uh, next weight class up, they said, man, he got hurt, do you want to take his place? I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll take his place. So in that tournament, I took my weight class and the other weight class uh, in the same tournament, won both of them, right? And again, it's not to pat myself on the back, but I'm going to make a point. And there was, you know, I got selected to be a, 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 a teacher at the drill sergeant school, which was considered to be a very uh, um, prestigious thing. Because we'd have senators and other generals from Washington, D.C. to come and stop in the school and say, hey, how are you training the drill sergeant? They'd sit in my class sometimes. And, you know, and be, you'd think it'd be kind of nerve-wracking, and it was initially. But, you know, you get kind of used to it. You figure out, hey, they're just other people like me. They sit in my class. They're gonna, they have to listen to me today so I can say whatever I feel like saying, you know, to, to train the other uh, uh, sergeants that are there. But I got done with all that, you know, and, and, and my record looked good. You know, I even, uh, for those of y'all that like to shoot, I went to sniper school, and, and I did that for a while. And, you know, really good time. I enjoyed all that stuff. Uh, but after that, you know, I, f I figured, you know, as a young man, you kind of like those things. You like the accolades. You like the, the pats on the back, you know, for people saying, hey, man, you're doing really good. You know, I, I wish I could do those things. And, and I used to like hearing that kind of stuff. And it's like, man, that was my fuel. That was my motivation, you know, to show people how good I was at things, how, be how good I could run and all this stuff. Uh, uh, when I was a drill sergeant over basic trainees, one of the things that used to motivate me was uh, listening to the other soldiers say, hey, there goes drill sergeant Spears going by. I mean, he's faster than everybody. You know, he's stronger. That's my drill sergeant. I used to love hearing that. But again, what would that do? It would feed my ego. It would feed my pride, right? And then all of a sudden, uh, I was about to get out. Like I said, I was on uh, what they call terminal leave. I was on the, the, the last part of my vacation before I got out of the Army. And I felt like the Lord was calling me to preach. And I, that was the last thing I wanted to do. I was like, Lord, I don't want to preach. My dad does it. I have two uncles that preach. I don't want to do that. You know, I got other plans. I was telling the Lord. And, and you know, uh, to keep the story a little bit shorter, I, I finally asked Renner to preach. Well, I said, okay, all right, all right God, I'll do it. You know, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. However, right, I can't, just came with the clause, Lord, I'll do it, but I, who am I? I said, who am I? I don't know anything. I was never paid to be smart. I, I, I've, I've shot guns, you know, my entire career. That's all I did. You know, how am I going to be a preacher? You know, I told the Lord that. Lo and behold, a month later, I was on my motorcycle, uh, still on, uh, like I said, terminal leave, about to get out of the Army, and I got hit by a car on my motorcycle. Some of y'all probably see me limping around. But, um, so I got hit, hit by a car. The car was going about 55. Uh, and I got T-boned from the left side. Got trapped under the car for about 100 feet and drugged down the road and spit out the back. And I don't remember any of it, thank the Lord. I, I kind of remember some sounds, but that's about it. Um, they said I got drugged down the road, spit out the back of it, and, uh, and you know, that was it. They said I was trying to get up. I don't know. I, was, I couldn't remember anything. But, you know, starting from the top down, I, I fractured my skull up here on the right side, um, broke all the orbital bones in my face. If you ever see an x-ray of my face, you'll see seven plates in there. Got plates all over the place. Uh, broke my upper jaw. Uh, broke my arm up here, both uh, shoulders messed up, uh, shoulder blades were all broken into pieces, um, broke about seven ribs, uh, messed up my, my tailbone, I don't know, tailbones I guess are important, but I messed mine up pretty good, right, messed up my left hip, it was all in pieces, my, my pelvis was snapped in half, they called it a wishbone fracture where you're basically just broken in half, kind of like a wishbone, uh, they said at one point that when they brought me into the ER, they said my, my right hip was like all the way up crushing my left, uh, my right lung, it was all the way, you know, pushed up that high, um, Blew out both my knees, uh, broke my left shin bone, broke both my ankles, and, and you know, they said I'd never walk again. You, you know, you'd never walk again. Both my legs were paralyzed initially, and they even considered cutting them both off because they weren't getting circulation. 
And I said I was bleeding so bad from my femoral arteries that they said, you have no, no other choice but to go in there and just coil them off. You know? So guess what happens when you coil off arteries? Well, your legs don't get no, no, no kind of blood. So they was about to amputate my legs. The nurse came in and said, at the last minute, you know, they kept trying to push it out. You know, we don't want to amputate his legs. Um, but the last minute nurse, they was about to do it. The nurse came in and she said she felt a pulse. You know, everybody was praying for my church. Was there in the waiting room praying for me. And um, they said they felt a pulse in my leg. You know, and, and there you go. And, and I don't remember any of this, right? I was still out, thank the Lord. Uh, but anyway, when I came to, after all that, after all these surgeries, putting me back together, putting all these plates in my face and, and doing all this stuff, um, I remember waking up, and I remember feeling just such a peace. And I remember just, I remember laughing at myself, thinking, you know, I prayed for it. I prayed for the Lord to do something drastic, and look, look what happened, right? And then kind of going back to this, it says, there in verse 26, going back to our scripture here, it says, For you see your calling, brethren, right? And what Paul is saying there says, when you see your calling, when you look out at your crowd, when you look out at all the Christians, you're not going to see many wise. It says, uh, there, that not many wise according to the flesh, and not many mighty, uh, and not many noble are called. And I remember thinking about that verse after my accident, thinking, you know what, there I was, thinking I was on top of the world physically. You know, I would look at everybody arrogantly thinking, I could take him, I could take that guy, you know. And that's a young man's thinking, maybe. But I used to sit back and think that way. And it's a very horrible way to think about it. But, you know, there I am, military guy. And, and I came to the realization that, hey, there's something wrong with me. And I said, Lord, you need to fix it. And there he was. He came and broke me up. He's like, I got you. I got your back. You asked for it. Here we go. Right? Uh, crash course and the, some humility. And I remember being there I, I, for a while, and I don't mean to gross anybody out, but you know, just, I probably won't tell the story very often, probably hardly at all. But you know, the, um, they said when I got stuck under the car, you know, my pelvis was all messed up. You know, when you start getting rolled around, the, the broken pelvis starts crushing things inside, right? So I had a lot of you know, stuff inside my colon get messed up, I guess, and things like that. So I had a, what they call a colostomy on, on my left side for a while. They basically, what they do is they disconnect part of your intestine and put it into a bag. You know, so there it is on my left side. On my right side, they had a tube going into my bladder, you know, so there I had two bags, you know, I always had to walk around with, right? And I don't mean to be gross, but there I was, right? And I remember, one of the things I remember too is my dad used to always say, you know, hope I die with dignity and never have to do things like that, you know? And I remember thinking about that. Here I am, uh, 27 years old, and I'm having to deal with it, you know? And I, but at the, at the time, I was happy. I was like, you know what? I asked for it. The Lord knows what he's doing. I got to just trust in him that he knows what he's going to do, right? And they told me from the beginning, we don't know if this is ever going to go away. We don't know if... Uh, you might have to live with it for the rest of your life. We'll, we'll check back in a year, see how you're healing up. But you know what? You're going to have to live with this for a while, right? And it, and it, was, a, it was a hard thing to get used to, right? But at the same time, I'll, I'll, tell, you, I'll tell you this. And to this day, um, I don't remember a time when I, I felt closer to the Lord than when I had all those problems. I couldn't even get out of a bed. I remember when I first woke up 19 days later, I remember holding my arms up and looking at how skinny my arms were because I hadn't moved in 19 days. I remember holding up. It felt like I had bricks in my hands. I was so weak and... I was like, man, what happened to my hands, you know, and, and they even cautiously asked me if I wanted a mirror and things like that, you know, and all these things, and, and uh, man, I just felt so weak, but I felt, I felt so at peace, and I can say that with just all honesty. There I was in the bed, couldn't get up, you know, I had all these memories of doing all these great things, right, physically, but there I was, couldn't even get out of a bed, you know, and, and I just felt such peace from the Lord, and I just felt joy. There was pain, yeah, there was pain, there still is sometimes, but I just felt such joy and peace, and I remember, again, just laughing to myself, I asked for it. Here I am, you know, the Lord came through for me, right? He answered this prayer. But at the same time, you know, it was necessary for me. I remember I used to have kind of a disdain for people with educations in a way. In a way, right? Not, not completely. But I used to look at doctors and think, man, these, they think they're all that, you know, and all this stuff. And guess what? The guys who were coming to encourage me were the doctors. Coming in, the nurses and, and the healthcare field. They coming in to encourage me, you know, during my healing process. In the ICU, they would talk to me. I had a tube, uh, 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 trach tracheotomy, you know, where they have that tube out your throat and stuff like that. Uh, they didn't know if I'd be able to ever get rid of that. You know, thankfully, I don't have one of those. I still got the scar. But, you know, they'd come and talk to me. I couldn't talk back, but they would encourage me. You're doing pretty good today, Mr. Spears, blah, 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 all this stuff. And you're having to have somebody else uh, serve me, even literally feed me, you know, brush my teeth. And I remember that was one of the things I enjoyed the most was when they would come with this little toothpick-looking thing with a little sponge on, glued to the end of it. And they would dip it in water and, you know, and kind of brush my teeth out. I like that because with the tracheotomy, you can't, you can't drink, you know, because stuff will start going down the wrong way. So my mouth was always dry and... Man, I enjoyed that time when they'd come brush my teeth out, you know, and have to dry my mouth back out. But, I felt, you know, but again, here during this time, I can honestly say that was the time I felt close to the Lord. I always felt like He's right there, holding on to me. You know, I felt so encouraged and all these stuff. I was never discouraged, you know, to be honest with you. And I just felt great. But then here, coming back to the sin, God doesn't choose, choose the wise and the mighty. He says, not many wise, I should say. Not many wise and noble are called. He says, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame... Put to shame the things which are mighty. Right? And there's so many stories that come with that. And I got one story that's interesting with that is uh, 
Uh, there was a, there, out on the mission field, I heard a story from an old missionary down there. He said there was a guy that uh, was very simple-minded, if you will. Couldn't, couldn't read, couldn't do many things there out there in Peru. And uh, he would say that, you know, one, he, he came forward in church one time. He said, you know what, I think the Lord's called me to preach. And he said, of course, in the, his first knee-jerk reaction would say, you know, you can't, you know, you can't even hardly read. What do you think you're going to, how are you going to preach, you know? How are you going to go to Bible school? And he said that was his knee-jerk reaction, but he tried to encourage the guy. Saying, oh, okay, that, that's good, you know, that's good. And uh, he said he had to go home a short time later, you know, come back to the States, so he didn't think much of it. And he said, guess what, a couple years later, he's going back down there to Peru, and he's walking through a marketplace, and he's hearing somebody preaching. You know, kind of slow of speech and stuff like that. But he says he's got there, and he, he sees somebody preaching. He's like, oh, who's preaching? You know, I want to go and encourage him. Let's see who it is. He's making his way through the crowd there in Peru, and, you know, marketplaces get really crowded. He's hearing some guy keeps quoting John 3.16 and talking about it. John 3.16 and talking about it. The closer he gets, guess what? He finds out it's that guy, that real simple guy. And he says, hey, you're preaching. You know, how, you know what's going on here? He says, well, I, don't, I can't do much. And I'm kind of summarizing the story. He said, but I could memorize John 3.16 and share it with other people. And there he is out there preaching in the marketplace. All right. Not many, not many it says um, there in verse 27, uh, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise thing. Right. And we look at ourselves and many times as Christians, we'll, we'll look at ourselves, we'll look across and we, we, we think, hey, we're not very special. You know, we look at we look at so and so, uh, and they they don't look like they can do much. And you know, that person drives an old beat up car. They don't, you know, in the eyes of the world, that doesn't mean much, right? You see the doctors, and you see the lawyers. They got these real nice cars. I like cars, by the way. But you see them in the cars, and you look at, man, I wish I had that car. You know, you see somebody drive up in a car like that. What do you think? Oh, they must be important. I wonder what they're doing in life to to get that success, right? Or you look at their shoes, or whatever it could be. You look at their education, all the degrees hanging on the wall. You might think, man, they must be special. I wonder what they're doing. You know, we start to put them up on a pedestal. But then we have to go back to this verse. And when Paul's saying, he says, hey, guess what? The pe- those aren't the people that in the, in the eyes of the Lord. He, that's not the ones he's going to choose to do mighty things. Right? He's going to choose the ones that are broken down. Right? The Bible in uh, uh, Isaiah 66 says that, that God... Let's, well, might as well look there real quick. Let's look at Isaiah 66, 1 if you have your Bible. I don't want to misquote it or misrepresent, but... One of my favorite verses, a great verse of encouragement, if you will. It says, Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build for me? It says, And where is my place? Uh, and where is the place of my rest? For all those things has my hand made, and all those things exist, says the Lord. So the Lord's got all that stuff. He doesn't need somebody, that, He doesn't need a person that thinks they're smart, if that makes sense. You know, and I'm not saying he can't use them. That, don't please don't take that that message from this. But but he says I don't I don't need all this stuff. I don't need somebody that's physically strong. You know I've made all this stuff. Why do I need? I, I looked at the oceans and I said, hey, you stop right there. Don't come up any further. Right? When's the last time we saw we saw the oceans just completely rise unless it's like a tsunami? But you know for the most part they they stay right there. We see the mountains rise up. And the Lord said, hey, you get you get this tall, and, and I want you to that that's about as high as I want you to go. Right? He put the stars in the sky and says, you stay there till till I need you to come down. You know, what's my little measly, uh, I don't know, if you like to brag about bench pressing or whatever, what's your measly 225-pound bench, you know, 250, whatever you want to look at, 300-pound bench press, what is that in, in the light of what the things that God can do, right? I mean, I mean, it sounds silly to try to compare those things and say, well, that guy over there, you know, he, mu- he must be, you know, he looks good. You know, I bet he could really play the part of, of, of being in ministry or doing something mighty for the Lord. Or that guy over there, he drives a nice car or whatever. We, you know, we could, t- we could take this and apply it to any way. But we can say, well, look at that. You know, he could, I bet he could do some really great things for God. But God is in this verse here in Isaiah 66 is saying, I've, I've already done all the, the great marvelous, marvelous things. He's like, what do I need your little measly uh, offerings, if you will? He's like, I don't need it. But then he says, uh, continuing on here in verse 2, he says, But on this one will I look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit, and who trembles at my word. Right? Hey, hey, there, there's a pretty good qualification for any Christian that wants to do something for God. He doesn't need all this, this stuff. You don't need to be good looking like... Uh, like Hollywood, and you don't need to be a great speaker. You don't need to be doing all these things. God doesn't need that. Moses, he wasn't a great speaker, and guess what? God still made provisions, if you will, for him to continue in his will. We don't need all these things. Every single excuse that we think we have for not doing the will of the Lord, it, it's, it's, it's moot. It doesn't make sense, right? Here I was two years later still in a wheelchair thinking, I surrendered to preach. What in the world am I going to do? Lord, how am I going to do it? I started hearing it from some of my friends. Right? If God's called you to preach, and they would say, if God's called you to preach, how are you going to get up and go walk and talk to people? And I was thinking, well, you're supposed to be encouraging me here, but it's not coming across that way. Right? But they would ask me that. You know, and they said, how are you going to do it? 
And I would tell him, it's like, you know, the Lord called me to preach. I'll let him worry about that stuff. I'm just going to worry about doing my best to be faithful and keep on following him. One of the important things I learned in the army is when somebody tells you to do something, you go do it. Right. And, and that's and when the Lord, when I feel like the Lord's calling us, I'm thankful and my wife, she completely supports me in that. But I feel like, you know, if the Lord calls us to do something, who in the world am I to say, I, I ain't doing it, God. I can't. You know, my leg's broken. You know, my, my leg hurts. That's not my place. God can fix things. You know, the Bible says that God equips us for, for everything, you know, that we need to do uh, uh, for his will. I'm kind of paraphrasing that, but that, that's what he says. So we, there's no excuse. Right? Now, why does God do this? Why does God not choose to call many that are mighty and many that are noble and many that are wise? What, what is his reasoning behind that? And the reasoning behind that, he says uh, there in verse 29, well, let's look at verse 28 and to continue our thought. It says, and the base things of the world and the things which are despised... God has chosen. All right, one of the things we do understand is, is, as time is going on, and one thing in my generation I'm starting to realize is that there's, there's become a, a greater rift between Christianity and the world. Granted, it's always kind of been there, right? but it's, get, it's, it's getting louder, if you will. Right? It's, it seems like that, that the rift is getting greater. It seems like, man, there, a lot of people are really speaking out against Christianity in our country, and it's kind of sad. You know, what do we do? Keep preaching the Bible. Keep on going the way that we're supposed to be going. Right? Uh, continue on in verse 30. It says, But of him... Excuse me, verse 29. Uh, let's continue verse 28. It says, And the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not, to bring uh, to nothing the things that are. And why? Here's the question, why? Why does God do this? That no flesh should glory in His presence. Right? Did you know God didn't make us to receive glory? God didn't make us to receive pats on the back. And I'm not saying encouragement. Encouragement's a different thing. You know, saying, say, hey, you did a good job. That's good. Right? But when we talk about praise, we talk about something that's continual. Right? We're supposed to praise God continually. Man is not supposed to receive those kinds of things. We're not made to receive a, a, a pats on the back for the rest of our life. Yes, it feels good. Yes, it feeds our ego. Right? Sometimes we like to stand in that spotlight and feel good. But guess what? It's not meant for us. It's not meant for us. Look at, look at everybody. If you could take uh, 10,000 movie stars from today until however far we got to go back you know, in time to get 10,000 movie stars and just put them all together. And, and look, how, look at all the awards they got, the Grammys, let's say, and all their awards, all the money and, and the cars and, and the material things of the world that they have and all their followers and fans. If we were to put them up and you, you was to ask them, how, how many of y'all are happy? Tell you what, they, they go from marriage to marriage. They can't find any kind of thing that works. You know, they jump from psychologist to, to psychologist, belief to belief, trying to find this happiness. They, they ain't finding it, right? Guess what? Little old Christian back here in the corner, guess what? They found it. They found peace, right? They found rest for their soul. And you got these people with millions and millions of dollars. They can't find it, right? Because they're looking for it in the wrong place. Again, why? They're, there they are going through life. Uh, uh, enjoying the, the pats on the back and the accolades and all that stuff. And guess what God's saying? It's like, I don't need that. That's not who I'm going to use. That's not the people that I like to call. It says, but of him, verse, th uh, verse 30, it says, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us uh, wisdom from God and righteousness and san sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Right? Why does God do it? So we're not go going back and saying, hey, you know, I really, uh, the reason that church over there is growing is because they got a good pastor or they got a good singer. That's the last thing the Lord wants to hear, that, in all honesty. We're not supposed to glory in the things that we can do, right? And if that does happen, and again, it's not, don't, don't confuse encouragement, if you will, and a job well done to, to, to being praised. I'm not, I'm not talking about it. Everybody deserves uh, encouragement at some point in life. We all need it. In fact, Paul preaches a lot about encouragement and building each other up, right? But at the same time, when, when we start to feel, hey, you're starting to feel proud, watch out. Because I tell you what, especially if you're in the work of the Lord, because that's not who God wants there, right? You don't don't point fingers and say, "Oh, it's because of that. It's because of this." The Bible says that God added to their numbers daily. If you look, if you read the Book of Acts, God's the one that added to their numbers, right? And if we go about trying to add numbers ourselves and do it in our own strength, guess what? We're going to have to maintain it in our own strength, right? It's one one thing that I've learned in uh, uh, you know serving with other pastors. One one pastor beat that in my head all the time. If you, you go out and you try to create all these programs, he said, not that they're not bad, some of them, because God leads in some of these ways. Right? But he said, you go out there in your own mind and read all these books about business ethics. I had a, uh, uh, when I was in um, Bible school, they wanted us to read this book on business ethics. Right? To learn, they, they say, church is like a business. And you look at it like that. Man, I get frustrated. Like, oh, my goodness. And that was me. I'm not saying there wasn't good wisdom to be found, right? maybe in that book. But at that time, man, it really frustrated me. It's like, what in the world am I doing reading a book about business ethics you know, and, and all this stuff? And it, man, it frustrated me to death. But then I kept going back to the word there in Acts. You know? God's going to add to the numbers. If you try to do something crazy and, and go out there and knock on a thousand doors a day, guess what? You're going to have to keep knocking on a thousand doors a day to keep the same amount of people that you want there. Let God do the work. What does God call us to do? You know, hey, he calls us to be faithful. 
you know, and, and love people, love others, because all the commandments are built on that. Share the word, right? And all these other things. I mean, there's the, the Christian life, yes, there's going to be trials and stuff, but at the same time, we're not to carry on the work of the Lord, if you will, right? We participate, but let him, let him do the heavy lifting, if that makes sense, right? So that's why God says, because if we start doing that, if I, if I come up with some program uh, 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 there in South Carolina where I was assistant pastor, uh, a couple of the pastors came to our pastor there at our church and said, hey, you know, I want to get your sermon on tithing. You know, he's like, why? Because it seems like your church gives a lot. You know, you got all this stuff, and I want to get your, your, your sermon on tithing. He says, well, I don't have one. I don't have a sermon on tithing. He's like, people read the Bible and tell them they should do it, you know, and, uh, but I don't have any special program, if you will, to try to get people to tithe. Because, again, if he's got that, guess what he's going to have to, that's, that's what he told me. If I, if I create some big old program that I have to keep teaching it, you know, because I, now I'm the one maintaining it, he would say, right? Because now he's glorying in the program. It's the program that works, not the Lord, right? That's how people would look at it. So here we go back to the topic here. He who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Every single blessing, man, that comes out there, every, every, every one that's added to our body, it's not because of something special that we did. We participated, right? We come alongside, but ultimately it's the Lord. All good things come from the Lord. That's one thing we need to remember. And one thing, the biggest lesson that, that I've been taught in my life, you know, coming from that accident, is guess what? You can't be glorying in yourself now, right? I, I better keep that mentality because I, I get that fear sometimes, you know, from the Lord saying, you know, watch out for pride. Watch out for pride because I tell you, he'll get you. You know, he will because God hates pride. We know that. But we need to be careful of that. And all good things, you know, to, to always keep in mind that if we're going to glory, make sure we're glorying in the Lord. You know, it's not because of our own strength. It's not because of anything that we do uh, that we're, that we're, we're going to get anything done. It's because uh, of what God does for us. All right. So that, that's the message I had today. And I really hope God spoke to your hearts about, uh, through this. Um, glory in the Lord. You know, uh, I heard a preacher say one time in, in his message, and I thought he was, started to sound like a broken record, literally. But he started saying, he says, brag about God and he will take care of you. He said it over and over and over in a sermon. I was like, man, is he going to stop saying that? You know, but the point was, you know, brag about God and all will be well with you, he said. Brag about God and all will be well with you. Now, I'm not going to do the same thing he did, say it 20 times in a row. But, you know, take, take that from today. Brag about God and all will be well with you. You might say, oh, I'm scared. I'm kind of scared to do it. You know, I got, I got, I got you know, people watching me. They might make fun of me. Well, hey, that, that's okay. You know, it doesn't matter. You know, who really matters? One is God. And I know I can say it, and I know it sounds cliche to say, oh, that doesn't matter. Oh, don't be scared. Right? But yeah, it, you'll never regret doing it. I'll say it that way. You'll always regret not doing it, but you'll never regret doing it, if that makes sense, and, and being bold for the God. But brag about God, and, and all will be well with you. All right? So um, I guess, Fred, I'm not exactly familiar with what you do after this. Have everybody stand. I guess everybody can go ahead and stand to their feet, and we'll, we'll go ahead and pray. Have an invitation. Okay. Who leaves the invitation? Sister? Okay. Go ahead. Let's stand for our hand of invitation.